Welcome to the Fatherhood Challenge program. The Fatherhood Challenge is a movement to awaken and inspire fathers everywhere to take great pride in their role and to challenge society to understand how important fathers are to the stability of an environment and culture. We're going to encourage and challenge each other to step up and do courageous things that make our families and communities better places. So let's get to it. Greetings, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me. It is always good to have you with me. I have a special guest with me. His name is Pastor Mike Tucker. Pastor Mike Tucker is the is the leader um, and the speaker of the Faith for Today. Actually, title correct title will be the speaker emeritus at Faith for Today. But with that, he's done a whole lot more. And one of the biggest things that he's been a contributor is the cause of marriages. Uh, he's been a big advocate for promoting stable Christian marriages. Uh, he's done a lot of work with that, and that's the reason why we have him on the show. But there is something to be said about having a stable marriage and what that can do for a family and what that can do for a home. So with that, we're going to go ahead and just jump right on in. So did you have a favorite dad joke for us at all? I was just curious. We usually like to start that out as a tradition. <laughs> That that's a good idea. You know, I uh, I don't have a lot of dad jokes, but I go to a gym that you have to be fifty five years old to get into, so everybody there is older than dirt and uh, like me. And uh, one older lady today told told me a joke. She said, "Why are ghosts bad liars?" I said, "Why?" She said, "Because you can see right through them." So I thought that. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, that's good. That'll work. <laughs> that's a great one. <laughs> yeah, I kind of like it. So I'll give that. Uh, I'll give credit to that to Anne at, at the uh, the gym in Grand Prairie, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let's talk about let's talk about marriage. Why are stable marriages so important for kids nowadays? You know, the research shows us that if indeed you've got a happy, stable marriage, that provides the best statistical opportunity for kids to grow up to be healthy, happy, and, and well-balanced. Um, because it, having a, a mom and a dad, both in the home, who love each other, so there's low conflict, um, is a safe environment for a child. Um, they have fewer identity issues. Um, that means sexual identity, personal identity, it, just fewer issues in general. Uh, their school scores seem to, to be higher. They have fewer psychosomatic illnesses. When mom and dad are both in a stable marriage and with low conflict, and they seem to be happy. So again, that, that research has, has been repeated over and over again, and it appears to be almost infallible now. So with that, what trends do you see happening with fathers and marriages? Are you seeing that more dads are in stable marriages now than they used to be? Um, or not? And if not, uh, why? And if so, why? You know, the, the divorce factor, it, it goes up and down a little bit. You know, there was the myth that uh, the divorce uh, average in the United States was 50%. It's never been that. The highest it's ever been is in 1980 when it reached uh, 40%. And now it's in the 30s. And that it goes up and down a little bit between 34 to 38 or so. Uh, second marriages are even more unstable. They they end up divorce more often. Um, so I don't know that that has changed so much. What I do see more of now is people who who are having uh, children without the benefits of marriage, and uh, that the research shows that men who who do that uh, have a, a a less of a commitment to the relationship than does the woman. Uh, most men, when pressed, would admit that they they view the lack of marriage as an opportunity to opt out, whereas most women uh, do not view it that way. And again, that's a rule of thumb. I mean, you know, it's a statistical anomaly. And there are some who would say, well, that's not true in my relationship. And that's, you know, you're, you're probably right. But um, across the country, that is something that we see. And wherever that exists, then there is uncertainty and un instability in the home. So I think that the issue of, of uh, people living together without the benefits of marriage and having children in those relationships is what makes it um, more risky for children. 
I, I just talked to a grandmother who's raising her grandchildren right now because her daughter has had three children and has never been married, and they're three different fathers. And the children are really a, a mess. They just feel uh, at, at, at loose ends, not performing well in school. And so two of the children have moved in with her, and now their school scores are improving. They, they are having fewer emotional tantrums, uh, uh, less psychosomatic illnesses, and just greater stability uh, overall, simply because this, her, her, their grandmother and grandfather are in the home providing stability and safety for them. So I think that that's what I'm seeing more is just um, uh, children who are born without the benefits of marriage, and that means that there's instability in in the home, a greater chance of instability in, in the home. I think that clears up a lot of questions I had about that. There's there's one that does come to mind, and that is, uh, and I don't know if this is true or not, but I've always heard that uh, a father plays an influence, for example, on the daughter's choice for a husband when she becomes old enough to marry. Is that true? Yes, it is. And, and a healthy, stable marriage where the father is playing a, a role as a father, which means that he starts with warmth and then adds um, structure, which is the best formula. Um, Daughters will hold the father in high regard and will try to marry someone like their dad. The same holds true, though, if indeed the father is distant, um, if he is unsupportive, if he is emotionally unavailable. Quite often, girls will try to marry someone similar to that to resolve and the those issues. In other words, to succeed in finding intimacy with that kind of a man whereas they failed with their own fathers. They, they don't know they're doing that, but you'll see that pattern repeated over and over again. Daughters tend to marry uh, men who are, are like their fathers, either to emulate a healthy relationship or to try to fix an unhealthy relationship and find success and acceptance in a relationship of that nature, uh, whereas before they did not find success or acceptance. Um, and again, uh, you know, there there are variations on that theme. I mean, some girls would just do rebel so strongly, they'll go the other extreme. And um, But over and over again, we see this pattern repeating itself where, you know, the, the father's influence of the home is huge because especially for girls, uh, the mother can tell her, you're beautiful, you're smart, you're capable, you can do anything. But if the father says that, she is more apt to believe it. And again, there's research demonstrating that. Um, if the father says you're a loser, you can't make measure up, you're, you're too dumb to do this, she's going to believe that, even though the mother says something otherwise and, uh, and there's ample, not enough evidence to support what the father is saying. It's still in the back of her mind. So a father's influence in the home is, is critical for daughters. And for boys, uh, boys begin to learn to how to deal with the opposite sex by watching the way their father deals with their mother and then their, their female siblings. They begin to emulate that. Uh, they become the same kind of man their father is. And where, where the father is not present, um, uh, th there's no pattern to follow, and that becomes a confusing situation for, for young men growing up. And it produces a lot of young men with anger, a uh, feeling of rejection by the father who's not present in the home. You didn't care enough for me to be present. I'm, I don't measure up. Um, kind of a thing. And so, again, we see those patterns over and over. The father's influence is absolutely critical. Um, it doesn't mean it can't be overcome, but man, does it put a kid at a disadvantage. What would you say is the optimal solution or best course of action, action for that man or that woman that has found themselves in that position where they don't have that, that stable and present father, and they haven't had that throughout their life to look to and, and to lean on. And now it's time to, to form a home of their own. Where do they find that stability that they need? I've seen people um, address that issue in a number of different ways. One is simply to go to, to therapy, to, to get in some, some quality counseling, Christian counseling, and begin to examine the issues that have uh, occurred because of the lack of a a positive, affirming, loving uh, father in the home. Um, others, though, will 
address the issue by throughout life trying to find uh, mature, um, loving, supportive, affirming male figures in their life. This can be an uncle, uh, a grandfather, uh, some, someone of that nature who will play that role for them and grant them that affirmation. And then uh, watching successful patterns, we tend to emulate the only pattern we've seen up close. But if you can begin to, to form friendships with husbands and wives who are older and successful, uh, you can sometimes uh, turn that pattern around because now you see how, what this looks like. Uh, if, you, if you've never seen it, how can you emulate it? And so seeing people who do this well uh, is another way to address this. Uh, you can begin to change your own pattern. I, I grew up in a home without, um, my mom and dad were both present but it was not the happiest of marriages. And, and my father, um, especially early on, was distant, uh, absent a lot, and, and abusive when he was there. And so that's something I had to address personally. And I, I didn't go to counseling for it, which is strange because I have a degree in counseling now. Makes you wonder why I didn't. But, uh, but I, I did have the benefit of having, of finding strong, healthy male figures uh, to be in relationship with, which gave me a pattern uh, for 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 living and behaving in a ways that were different than what my father did with me. Did you see that impact of of a distant father? Did you see that impact even further down in your marriage, or was it only did it only rear its head at the very beginning? You will see that impact for the rest of your life. Uh, because there are a lot of things that occur with that. Um, one, I, I found myself when, I'm, uh, when I was working and being supervised by an older man that, uh, that I respected, I really wanted his approval. And I thought, why am I so anxious for this man's approval? And then I, I began to realize I didn't have that with my own father. And so uh, even I was in my 40s and 50s when I recognized it happening again. I thought, well, don't you outgrow this? And apparently not. Um, and so uh, I think to one degree or another, uh, it's going to, to impact you for the rest of your life. The question is, are you aware of it? Are you, are you um, keen enough to see the signs when this is happening? And uh, do you have a, a mechanism for coping with it and dealing with it in a positive way so it doesn't negatively impact your relationships, your family, your life as a whole? and drive you into uh, unhealthy behaviors. Is there any hope for that father listening that is struggling to keep their home together? I mean, there's something that I hear, I've heard before where a husband and wife will try to stay together for the sake of the kids and whatnot, but the two of them just really aren't working out and they don't want to create a, they don't want to create an environment of divorce and put their kids through that through that stress, or they wait till the kids are grown and then they divorce and, and whatnot. Yeah. I, it's such a, a mess. And the, every time I hear that, it's like, this is like, this has got to be so far from God's original plan for marriage and what it was supposed to be. And I mean, is there any hope when it's at that level? Yeah, there's hope. Um, and, and there's not an easy answer for this. There's not a one answer fixes all for this because every relationship is different. Every situation is different. If there's abuse in the marriage, it's usually better for the children to divorce. Uh, they have a better chance of having a healthy, healthy environment if indeed abusive factors are not present in the home 24-7. And so uh, usually that is a better choice there. But um, to stay together for the sake of the children can be a viable, healthy option as long as the two of you are able to live at peace with one another and put on a good front. There's nothing wrong with that for the sake of the children. Um, if you're willing to make those sacrifices, if you're really willing to say, this is why we're doing it, we're going we're gonna to behave ourselves, we're going to get along, we're going to provide peace and happiness for the children, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, to be self-sacrificial for your children. Um, but that's not always um, a possibility. The emotions can be so high um, that uh, the conflict can be can be huge on a daily basis, and as such, at, at times you know it's it's better to 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 uh, find another option. Always counseling. I, I would I would urge anyone in that situation to seek competent 
um, certified Christian counseling because it's going to your best chance of getting help and and turning this thing around comes in that vein. Uh, some things cannot be simply prayed away; they have to be worked away, and that means that you go to somebody who knows how to help you to give you the insights. Like for me, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to be able to to, to spot uh, the the dysfunction that occurred because of my own poor parenting. Uh, what happened to me as a kid. But uh, but not everybody's able to do that. Not everybody's able to spot those things. And so a, a competent Christian counselor can help you with that and help you maybe put the tattered, broken pieces of the marriage back together. That, that's a far better option. I hope you're enjoying the program and getting value out of it. It's a labor of love and faith supported by listeners like you. Please consider donating by visiting thefatherhoodchallenge.com and clicking in the upper right corner and clicking on donate. Another way you can support this program is by sharing it with anyone who would appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Yeah, I definitely, I think that makes sense to me. It's, uh, I think sometimes it's harder for guys to, to admit that, yeah, we need a little bit of extra help. And I think yeah. in this specific example that we're talking about, um, I think that has to do with the fact that we think that because we need help, there's something wrong with us. And that guilt comes all the way back to the very beginning where a parent or parents weren't there for us when we needed them the most. And we try to find um, re a reason and we tried to make sense of that in our own mind. And so we default to, it has to be me. Uh, right. I have to, I must be the reason why it didn't work out. I must be the reason why um, he never shows up in my life and doesn't want to see me and all this. Therefore, now we're all the way back to you're in this marriage and everything is falling apart and it's back to me. It's, it's me. It's, it's all my fault. And so there's the shame in having to say, I need help. And in reality, none of it might be your fault. I mean, the very beginning source of it had nothing to do with you but there's still this stigma about asking for help and going to a counselor and getting that extra help when that should be a very normal thing to do. Absolutely. And in fact, a part of what we just have to do as, as a church, as pastors, as, as men, um, as, as a society, is to remove the stigma associated with seeking uh, help. Um, you know, if, if you got the flu, and you need antibiotics, you call your doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with that. You run into financial problems, you get a financial advisor. Uh, I recently, re I retired about a year and a half ago. You, you don't do that without somebody helping you with your money and helping plan how your income is going to be. And so, you know, I, I'm smart enough to say I need help here. There's no shame in that. But, the, but to somehow to admit that you have... Um, a problem with a relationship that you can't fix on your own, suddenly there's shame for this. Um, you know, we, we have to change that thinking because if you didn't grow up watching a positive relationship, how do you know how to make one? You, you don't. I mean, it's, it's asking the impossible of you. And so having someone who can help you sort through those things, um, people spend a lot of time and effort and energy studying human nature and and learning the skills necessary to make that happen. And we just need to be smart enough and mature enough to say, wow, uh, if, I get, if I get health issues, I go to my doctor. If I have financial issues, I go to a financial planner. If my car is broken, I can't fix it. I take it to a mechanic. And when my relationship is broken, I get help. I get competent professional help. There's no crime in that. There's no shame in that. Uh, and so we just have to change that thinking. You know, I think I speak a little bit from my own experience, too. Um, I, I was one of those it wasn't even a case where my dad was emotionally distant. He just physically wasn't there. He, I didn't even yeah. know who he was yeah. until I was probably in my um, college years or my twenties. Uh, and that's when I finally had met him for the first time. And after that, he was still in and out and then completely out uh, there. The pattern of abandonment was a constant thing for me. It made all the difference in the world to seek out a counselor yeah. Um, and earlier I heard you say uh, specifically a Christian counselor and 
I wanted to point that out because y- you didn't say counselor. You said Christian counselor. And I think the one, if I have to guess why you said that, it has to be this. Because a Christian counselor is going to come at things from the perspective of God's purpose. What was God's yeah. purpose for a stable marriage? Am right. I hitting the right points there? Absolutely, you are. Now, again, if you don't have one available, then going to a counselor is still a better shot than not doing anything. But I think that, that Christians view the world differently. We have a biblical world view. And, um, and if you have a counselor who doesn't understand that or even fights against it, then you run into some problems because now you're trying to compromise values uh, while you're fixing these issues. And that's, that's not healthy. But having someone who understands a biblical worldview, a Christocentric worldview, uh, will then help you say, all right, these are my values. This is why I'm doing this. Here's a better way to do it. They're going to have some of the same tools. I've got a degree in counseling. I've got a daughter who's a, who's a licensed professional counselor in the state of Texas. Um, and she, she and I both, and she more than I, because she's doing this as a living, uh, has a, a set of skills that are really helpful for people that she's talking to, to help them identify their problems and to give them tools for fixing the problems, uh, mechanisms for coping. Um, and she can do that as a Christian because she understands the, the worldview in which, uh, which these people operate. And because she's a Christian. So, yes, I think it's a better, it's a better choice in most cases. Uh, and by the way, that doesn't mean necessarily your pastor, because a lot of good pastors are bad counselors. Um, but having someone with, with competence, uh, with credentials in this area, some training in this area, um, is, a, is a better choice than just a pastor. Um, I'm a pastor, but I've also got a degree in counseling. Um, so... Um, I think a, a combination like that is better um, for those of us who operate within a Christian worldview. And that was the question I was, um, you kind of answered a little bit there, but I was going to ask, then what's the difference between a pastor counseling somebody and a trained mental health counselor or therapist doing the same thing? Yeah, pastors are good at spiritual issues. Uh, that's what That's what they're trained for. But psychological issues, there's very little training given in seminary unless you take extra coursework um, to know how to deal with that. And so uh, some, ca- uh, some pastors are poorly equipped to, to deal with such things. Um, the other thing that, that the professional training does for you is it forces you to begin to study yourself. You know, what, what are my issues? What's going on in my life? Why am I as I am? Uh, and if a pastor hasn't done that work, they can be very broken and have the, have the knowledge of how to deal things with things spiritually. But their brokenness, uh, if left unattended, can spill through in whatever advice they give you uh, as a, quote, counselor. Uh, if they're dealing with relationship issues or psychological issues that they're poorly equipped to deal with from an educational standpoint, but then from a personal standpoint, simply because they have s- such areas of brokenness that leaves them blind to their own um, their own vulnerabilities. So um, again, someone who's done this work both personally and uh, uh, academically, and then has been supervised. Uh, as they've gotten their their uh, hours for licensure, that's someone who's gone through a whole process uh, of self examination, examination of the of the scholasticism in this area, the the research, the uh, of the whole body of evidence and knowledge that has been created, and then learning practical tools for uh, applying it and having supervision as they do that. that. That's a whole process that makes a far better professional than. Uh, a pastor who may be able to tell you uh, the theology, but cannot tell you how, how practically to heal the relationship. I appreciate that, what you just said, because I don't really hear that. I don't know that I've ever heard that said when it comes to that. Usually people will say, yeah, go go see your pastor, go talk to your pastor. I don't really hear anyone saying, uh, no, actually go to a a trained counselor, a trained Mm -hmm. mental health therapist. And um, Mm -hmm. so that very good wisdom there. And and some pastors are good at it, but uh, a lot are not. 
And uh, I, would, I would venture to say that most are not as good as you would hope they would be, simply because it's not their fault. They're expected to do things they've never been trained for. Mm. And uh, so, you know, they, if you've got a question about the Bible or about um, some practical application of spiritual principles, pastors major in that, man. That's, that's what they're supposed to do. Um, Absolutely. But when it comes to how do I fix my marriage, uh, some of them don't know, and it's evident in their own marriage. And so it's usually better to find someone who actually knows what the research says, what the, what the literature talks about, what has been demonstrated to be effective, and uh, can help coach you through the process. As we're just wrapping up our time here, do you have a challenge for fathers before we go? I, I think that that fatherhood for me is the most guilt-producing thing I've ever done in my life. By the way, as a caveat to that, grandparenting is guilt-free, but that's, that's another story <laughs> altogether. <laughs> but parenting, no matter how good I was, it was, I knew it was never good enough, and I was afraid I was putting my own children in therapy. Uh, and now one is a therapist, and neither one of them are in therapy personally, and they're both Christians and in the church. So what I, what I have learned, though, is that um, as a father, I thought it was important that I be the, the strong rule maker and the one who, who gave guidance. And what I've discovered and what the research indicates is that the most effective fathers are those who begin with warmth. That means just simply love your kids and demonstrate it by being with them, by spending time with them, by praising them, by touching them and embracing them and, and praying with them and for them. And then you add structure. Structure is added, but only after your children know that you love them and, and care for them more than anything else. And when they see that and they experience that structure, that begins to give them in their life stability. So, and again, rules should be few and well chosen and evenly enforced. They should make sense. If you can't explain the rule, they don't have the rule. But um, but start with start with warmth and then add structure. And the other thing you can do is simply love your spouse. Um, and demonstrate it. Uh, it's better that you, my, my grandchildren were talking about their parents. Uh, we had them uh, Monday and they were talking about how embarrassed they were when mommy and daddy kissed in front of them. And I'm just so <laughs> glad that they are embarrassed because you know, that means they see it, they, oh, not again. What a glorious thing for a child to be embarrassed about, to have to be embarrassed that mommy and daddy love each other and demonstrate it by kissing. Absolutely. Um, you know, that I just, I just thanked Jesus for it. I was smiling ear to ear as they were telling me this. They thought I was laughing at their story. I wasn't. I was just thanking Jesus that uh, my daughter and my son-in-law love each other enough to demonstrate it for their children. So those would be the things I said. So. That's wonderful wisdom there. <laughs> Thank you so much for the time that you spent uh, that with us and the wisdom that you shared. It's greatly appreciated. Thank you, brother. It was my, my pleasure to be here. If you enjoyed the episode and receive value from it, there are three ways you can support the program. You can donate by visiting thefatherhoodchallenge.com and clicking in the upper right corner and clicking on donate. Thefatherhoodchallenge.com also has a store where you can find great gift ideas for others or yourself while helping to spread the word about this movement. Word of mouth and sharing through social media also helps make others aware of this program. Any way you're able to support the Fatherhood Challenge is appreciated. Thank you for listening.